Welcome to Breaking the Line, the ECNL podcast, a bi-weekly look at all things related to the growing elite clubs nationally, the ECNL. For more information on the ECNL, visit us at www.theecnl.com. Now, here's your host for Breaking the Line, the ECNL podcast, former U.S. soccer press officer and longtime soccer broadcaster, Dean Linky. I am Dean Linky, but you certainly don't need me when you have three incredibly bright, dedicated, and passionate people. On this week's edition of Breaking the Line, the ECNL podcast, let's hear from all three of them. This is Christian Lavers, the president and CEO of the Elite Clubs National League. This is Memo Cipuentes, Austin FC Under 12's Academy coach. This is Doug Lamov, the coaching methodology advisor for ECNL and author of books on coaching. Join Christian and Memo and myself to talk about game day coaching, halftime talks, pregame talks, live coaching during the match, and how we can help players to regulate their attention and their emotion while they play. It was great to be with you, Doug and Christian. I particularly liked our discussion about regulating emotions and understanding how to prepare for the halftime talks. This was a great conversation going into all sorts of different topics about emotion regulation, staff management, cognitive science, and more. So join Doug, Memo, and me on Breaking the Line, the ECNL podcast. And we will do just that after this message from the ECNL. As the game continues to evolve in the United States, the ECNL remains the standard of excellence in youth soccer. The Elite Clubs National League has grown to include over 200 clubs and nearly 50,000 players across the country with a robust competition platform for teams, educational resources for coaches and clubs, and unparalleled identification and development opportunities for players. Alongside its member clubs, collaborating to create a better future, the ECNL continues to raise the game every day. The ECNL is more than a league. Welcome back to Breaking the Line, the ECNL podcast. Once again, here's Dean. I am Dean Linky, and may I say one of the great things about being a part of Breaking the Line, the ECNL podcast, is turning the keys over to incredibly smart people who bring on incredibly smart guests. That's what we're going to do again today as I hand it over to the president and CEO of the ECNL, Christian Labors. Thank you, Dane. I appreciate the introduction. And before we dive into the topic today, I'd like to welcome back Doug Lemoff, the ECNL Coaching Methodology Advisor. Bring you back, Doug. I think you're the most frequent visitor to the show, except for Dean. So welcome back. Great to be back. Good to see you. And today we also have a guest, Memo Cifuentes from Austin FC. So Memo, this is your first time on the podcast. Maybe give everybody a little of your background. Thank you guys for having me. It's, it's a pleasure to be invited to, to this podcast. Like Christian mentioned, my name is Memo Cifuentes, uh, working as an under-12 head coach for Austin FC Academy. have had numerous experience through soccer. Started in a small town in Texas and grew up playing the sport. And one of the biggest challenges that we faced was the travel. And I know you guys have mentioned this in the podcast, the challenges of traveling. So what I ended up having to do is venture for myself to look for opportunities. And that's kind of been my traits is always looking for solutions, always looking for ways to improve things that got me into teaching. So I was a teacher for six years at my local high school and moved into Laredo, Texas to be part of a director of coaching role to increase my knowledge in the game and then got introduced to Austin FC as an intern while I was teaching at Austin ISD. A local school district in Austin. Had an internship with Austin in multiple roles, and now my second year as a under-12 head coach for the academy. All right. Well, I'm surrounded by two educators, so I'm going to be careful with my opinions here about coaching at this point. But Doug, I'll turn it back to you because I know one of the topics you've talked a lot about or been thinking a lot about in the last several months has been game day coaching, and it was your idea to talk and have a discussion about that on a podcast. So I'll turn it to you and, and cue it up. Yeah, I've just been paying attention lately to think about if our goal with athletes is to help them learn and develop for the long run. I think people are really attentive to that during training sessions and designing training more carefully to make sure that we're maximizing athletes' development. But I think a lot of that goes out the window. It either goes out the window on game day, or I have to say that 
coaches have a ton of questions when I go to work with a club, whether it's an MLS club or a youth club. One of the first questions I get asked is, what do I do at halftime? And that's, I would say, like national team rugby coaches have asked me that. What do I, how do I maximize performance and attention? How do I fix things at halftime? And youth coaches have asked me that, like, what do you think I should be doing to maximize learning at halftime or during the game? My first answer to that question was, I don't know. What do you think? And, you know, just had a lot of conversations with people. And so I've just been kind of thinking about this idea a lot and at least have some conjectural ideas that I think are helpful. And maybe the first like helpful thing is the most simplistic thing is like, let's just divide game day coaching into four buckets of actions that coaches take where they interact with players. And the first one is pregame talk, right? What do I say before the game to help you be successful and learn? And the second one is live coaching. Then the whistle blows and I stand on the sideline and I either shout or say or don't shout or don't say things to players while they're playing with the goal of helping them perform better or learn more. What do I do in those? What should I be thinking about in those situations? Then there's the halftime talk. How do I help my players adjust and perform their best and learn more? And then there's the dreaded post-game talk, <laughs> which, which any parent will tell you can sometimes go on for 20 minutes and sometimes be low value. But we call that bonus coaching, Doug. Bonus coaching, the bonus coaching. And so I just like one there, there, so there are at least four sort of moments of the game in on game day. And I think one of the most interesting things is how do we think about thinking about those not as separate, but as linking those things and maybe even linking them to things that we do in training. That's interesting. And I, I would add, and we were discussing this prior to hitting record on this, is also then the distinction between a learning-based and a performance-based halftime, which is probably most obviously appropriate when you're looking at different age groups and priorities within the age group. And that's not to say that there's not a component to learning even at a performance level, but that there can be a significant difference, for example, between a U18 team and a game that has results that are important versus a U11 or U12 team where really beyond the desire to win, which I believe is always important, the priority of the result is very, very low compared to using the game as an extension of training or an opportunity to use one of your concepts, Doug, to link the forgetting curve back into learning. I would say yes and to that, which is like, yes, I think that's an important distinction because we're always sort of doing both, right? We want to, we want to win often and we want to perform our best and use performing our best as a way to winning. And we want to learn. I would say that as part of this project, I've just been asking a lot of coaches to send me video of their halftime talks. And so I've seen halftime talks from like national teams in, in, in rugby in this case and professional teams and youth teams a USL team and they're fascinatingly similar actually I think one of the things performance a winning based halftime talk is really a learning based halftime talk on a very short turnaround right which is like we have some things we have to adjust we have some changes we have to make we have to learn them and execute them on a very short turnaround we have to build and leverage habits about emotion and attention I was telling you I, I heard this quote from uh, Ben Freakley who's a uh, sports psychologist who said, you know, elite, elite athletes are successful when they can manage their attention and their emotion under complex and difficult circumstances. So a lot of what we're doing is short term around learning and then building habits of how do I focus my attention on the important things? How do I manage my emotions at halftime? And then maybe even like, how do we as a team communicate and focus on the things that we need to do together to be successful in the next 90 minutes? I'll ask a question on that because when you Talk about the importance of managing emotions or intentionality in a halftime or in a game environment, which obviously is the highest sort of emotion and passion. How much of that is tied to the culture you have in training and the interaction on a regular basis between the players and the coach? Because you can't flip a switch on and off, I wouldn't think, between players that are able to quickly learn and apply if that is not a regular feature of the training environment. Emma, do you want to jump in on that first? Because I'm sure, you know, you live this with players a lot and maybe I'll, I'll jump in after you. I do. Yes. Christian, I think that's super important. One of the things that we really focus on the curriculum for the first part of the semester for the fall with all these players is building the culture. And a lot of the emphasis is on self-talk. So how continuously can we have the players quickly self-regulate in order for any activity to happen. So one of our mantras within the academy is called next action. It starts from the coach. So we, as a coach, we're trying to create a self-talk or quote unquote, us talking to them 
in trying to make sure they're subconsciously always saying this to themselves. So if they make a mistake, next action. If they score a goal, next action. What's next? It's always trying to know this action's already been in the past. Now what can we do moving forward? And I think it's super important to do that during specifically more in the halftime talk, as you mentioned, if we don't do that at training, how is it going to be done during the game? I think the other the piece of it is also the self-regulation of coaches. So how can we self-regulate as staff prior to us talking to the players themselves? Because we are also filled with emotions and trying to manage what we have in front of us and then make sure that we are properly communicating to the players to the best of our ability. Because I think one of the biggest things is we're trying to improve the performance of an individual as well as the performances of the team. So how can we do that best is, I think, uh, controlling our emotions. It starts with us. I think that's really insightful and helpful, which is, I, I just think like one of the rule, a good rule of thumb for our coaches is very little new that you can teach on game day. And so, you know, if I was going to summarize the three things that coaches probably say most at half times, they're like, stay focused, you know, like, don't panic or like, you know, and, uh, and communicate, right. And unless we've done those things and I've practiced doing those things in a training setting, I'm probably not going to like be able to suddenly tell you like, you know, stay calm. That's something we've worked on together and have a language for and to have some habits around. Those are also, I think, very broad words, right? Focus can mean a million different things and without some anchoring concept. And maybe I'll use this opportunity to, I have an opinion on this that's probably going to come out, but ask your thoughts on this, especially when you look at younger teams, because I'm sure you've seen this, Doug, in the half times you've looked at in the attempt to solve a problem on game day, the famous formation change at halftime going from two up front to three up front or three in the back to four in the back, whatever it may be. And my opinion is that a lot of times at a youth level, especially the formation change is not really solving a problem. It might put a player in a slightly different space, but what you're not doing is linking a formation change to what has previously been trained and therefore resulting in actual changed relationships and dynamics on the field. I raise this because to me, that's sort of square in the center of, are we using the game to build on the learning of training? Or maybe on the performance side, are we using training to prepare for the ability to make changes in a game? Or on game day, do I see a problem? And in my experienced head of see a solution by changing systems, but the players are completely ill-prepared to actually execute a different system in a way that's meaningfully tactically. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. But so the ideal situation is we say something like, guys, we're going to go, we're going to go from a 442 to a 352 here. And if we do that, like players should be able to talk about why and what that means we'll be able to do tactically. So I think just two principles of cognitive science that are really interesting to think about on game day are one, just the limits on working memory which is if I stand there at halftime and tell you eight things that I think that you should do, we don't control our memories, right? It would be great if we could decide what we remember, but we don't, we're not able to. Uh, and telling players eight things is going to overload their working memory and they probably won't remember anything. And then the second thing is that a cognitive scientist would tell you you are most likely to remember what you think about. Doug, can, so, I, can yeah. I interrupt you on that and ask a question? Because I think what you just said is really important because... <laughs> You said, if you tell them eight things, they're not going to remember anything. And I think they're- Unlikely to, yeah. Unlikely to. I think there, are, there is a maybe mistaken belief from a lot of coaches that if I tell them eight things, they're probably going to remember three or four of them at least. And therefore, I've covered a lot of ground and they might not remember it all, but they'll remember some. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really important point. When you overload working memory, is it really that you're going to end up with almost nothing meaningfully retained? versus I took a shotgun approach and everybody's going to take away a chunk of it, just not all of it. Because I think that's an important realization for a coach when you're talking about self-regulation. I think what the litany approach does, which is the litany is like, let me tell you everything that I can think of that you should do differently out in the field. There, there are nine of them. What it really does is it allows me to say, guys, I told you, <laughs> I, I told you to do this, but it doesn't really put me in a position to be able to do it. And so let's say we're just taking this example, going from four backs to we're going to a three, five, two. 
you know, there might be situations where we have to make a change that we have not anticipated. But if I've done my job as a coach and I'm, and we're going to a three, we're going to a three, five, two, like my player should know something about it. So maybe the first thing that I should do is say, we're going to go to a three, five, two in doing that. What are we trying to accomplish tactically and what language will we have to use with each other to remind each other the things we're trying to do 30 seconds to turn and talk with your teammate. Like maybe I even have got like, so I have guys in pairs, like then they talk for 30 seconds. Great. Tell me what, tell me that what that means we're trying to do and what we have to remember to do and what words we can use to remind ourselves. Our coaches all the time shout at guys, guys, communicate, communicate. And like, look, there's good communication and there's bad communication on the pitch when you're playing. There are guys who are building each other up. There are guys who are tearing each other down. There are guys who are saying productive things. There are guys who are saying non-productive things. The guys who talk more are not always more likely to say more productive things. So one of the smartest things I can do is like, okay, if we want to communicate what words, what phrases should we be using and prioritizing and communicating to each other the things we need to, you know, pressing high, getting wide, like let's, let, I want to hear you saying those things and reminding each other of those things because they are the tactical changes that we're trying to make. Or you might even say, I was thinking of it's for pregame talks, right? Again, same problem with like, I can tell you eight things, but really what would be more helpful if I, if I say, guys, here are th- three phrases that you're going to hear me say during the match today. The first one is press high. When I say press high, take 30 seconds to either think about this or talk to a partner about this. And I'll ask you, when you hear me say press high, what does, what should that make you think about? And what should that make you, what should you try to do? 30 seconds to discuss. Then they tell me about it. Then I take a few like, yes, it means you should do this. Yes. It means you should do do that. And now I'm causing them to like, we remember what we think about. I've caused them to think deeply about A, what the priority actions are, and B, how I react to these cues that I will be giving from the sideline. So now I know what to, now I know what to say on the sideline, which is press high, right? And hopefully now they will um, connect, be able to connect that phrase to a high priority action that they should be able to make, but only if they've really thought significantly about it in a in an intentional way. I'd like to follow that up with a question as well. And Memo, you you might have an opinion on this as well, because in that example, Doug you used sort of the, as you would call it, turn and talk technique to say, this is what I want you to think about. Now you guys talk about what that means, which is is very different from a command coaching of, hey, this is press high, this is what I want to see, or what you need to execute when we say press high, where you're giving them the answer. How do you balance the difference between when you ask them to engage with each other, which I would imagine is some type of retrieval practice, versus when it is more productive to give a command. And obviously time constraints are going to be one, but how do you balance the use of those two different teaching techniques? I'm going to say one tiny thing that I'll pass to Memo, who will have much better insights than me, I'm sure. But whether you are commanding or you're soliciting and asking your players to develop the solutions themselves, both both of which I think are legitimate actions and both of which are actions that a coach has to be able to take. There'll be sometimes when as the coach, you have to say, this is what we're going to do. It's the job of the coach. And there'll be sometimes when it's beneficial as the coach to say to the guys, what do you think we should do? Either way, guys will remember that conversation and be able to transfer it onto the field. If you do two things, limit the amount of information, prioritize to two or three things, right? So you don't overload working memory and cause them to think deliberately about it uh, and actively about it. We remember what we think about. So if I just tell them and they don't think about it, then it's unlikely to transfer But whether I'm commanding or asking, if I say, take 30 seconds to think about it, what's your role? Tell me what your role is. Diagram your role. Show me what that will look like here on the the whiteboard. Now I'm getting to the point where what we're talking about is more likely to transfer to the field. I'm sure you have more useful things to say, but that's at least a starting point. I I guess from the experience that I've had and just reviewing the videos that we've taken, because what we do at the Academy, we're recording all the pregame, halftime, and then the postgame talks and one of the interesting things i think going back to doug mentioned going from a four back system to a three back system is if we've trained it already then we can ask what do you guys think we should do and hopefully that response starts coming back and maybe we should change to a three back system for x y and z now if we have not done that solution at training or have not come up with a, a solution at training then i think it's the coach's responsibility saying hey this is what we needed to do and here's why. This is now the the time crunch, the limitations, the constraints that we have during a halftime talk. And I think that'd be the easiest way to to kind of go about it. 
Uh, one thing that I would like to mention is uh, going back to the pregame, what Doug had mentioned, there's, I think there's also numerous ways to, to do that. And one of our coaches at the older age groups gets more buy-in from players by sending them a scouting film and saying, hey guys, these group of players are responsible for showcasing for the pregame talk of how the opposition is building, how they're going to press, and how they're doing set pieces. And then from there, that is an organic way to get a, a more player buy-in and more teaching, right? So there's a leadership role. There's talking in front of their peers, uh, creating solutions for themselves, all these things. But it's an, a different way and approach to get the pregame talk and more buy-in from players to create that culture that we're a learning culture that we're trying to, to have. Fantastic discussion, guys. We need to take a break. And as Dean, the voice Lanky would say, pay some bills. So we'll be back and breaking the line in a minute. The ECNL is pleased to announce Quick Goal as the official goal provider and partner for ECNL Girls and ECNL Boys, a new partnership created to support the growth and development of the country's top players, clubs, and coaches. At all national events, including national playoffs and national finals, the Quick Goal Coaches Corner will provide hospitality and social space for ECNL girls, ECNL boys, and collegiate coaches. Quick Goal will also be the presenting sponsor of the National championship winning ECNL girls and ECNL boys coaches of the year and the ECNL girls and ECNL boys goals of the year. Quick Goal looks forward to helping the ECNL continue to elevate the standards of youth soccer and provide more opportunities to players on and off the field in the coming years. Nike is a proud sponsor of ECNL Girls. Nothing can stop what we can do together to bring positive change to our communities. You can't stop sport because hashtag you can't stop our voices. Follow Nike on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. From athletes just starting to turn heads to some of the best athletes to ever play their games, Gatorade shows that they are the proven fuel of the best. For the athletes who give everything, nothing beats Gatorade the studied, tested, and proven fuel of the ECNL. Okay, so continuing this discussion of game day coaching, which I think has been really interesting, and I know we're all over the place here from some cognitive science to some tactical problems to different, uh, the four moments, as you indicated, Doug, on game day coaching. One other area I think that is an interesting topic is correcting a mistake or a problem in the game uh, versus potentially anticipating future changes that are necessary in the game. Because I think a lot of halftimes spend 90% of the halftime looking backwards towards what went wrong or what we might be able to exploit, which might work at a certain level. But as you get to a higher level of coaching, I think it's more and more important that you recognize that the other side is going to have something to say as well. How do you balance or what do you suggest when you're looking at using halftime as a moment to prep or prepare players for changes that may be necessary in the second half because you're anticipating the opposition has a tactical change or you're anticipating a different problem that may arise because the opposition is going to do something different. One, I think we, we all need a framework for what we're going to be doing throughout the entire game. So what we've divided at the academy is what, what are we going to be doing in the first 10 minutes of the half? And then what are we going to be doing 10 minutes prior to the half? So to prepare for the halftime talk, we're going to focus on the, the prior 10 minutes to the half. And what are the three coaching points that we want to emphasize as staff? So how do we get to that? I get with my assistant coach and we talk about the three coaching points that we want to make. Is there any changes that we want to make? Like what you mentioned, is there a lineup change? Is there uh, something that we see in the opposition that this is how we're going to change structurally? or this is how we're going to build, this is how we're going to press in order to talk about it during halftime. I think that is a crucial part of the halftime talk is the preparation. And then understanding who's going to be talking and who's going to be making those coaching points. Am I, as the head coach, going to make the tactical points or, or am I going to be making this, the lineup discussions or am I going to be making the emotion regulation with myself or what type of motivational talk do I need to tell the players? So I think that is the first and foremost, the crucial thing that we need to do in preparation for that. 
there are two things that I maybe build off of where you started us memo, which I think are really insightful. I, I love what you guys do with, I've seen this in a lot of the halftime videos that memo sent, which is the halftime talk focuses on the first 10 minutes, the second half. And I like that idea because one, it's finite and it's actionable and right. You're like, I think that's really like, that's something that I can accomplish as a player. Which is we're going to go out and we're going to try and make this change in the first 10 minutes. We're going to focus on it as opposed to like, it feels sort of more vague to be like the whole second half, right? The first 10 minutes, we're going to really focus on making this change. That also contemplates the fact that like, and it may not be the right change for the whole half, right? It sort of opens us up to like further tactical changes. So I think that that's, re that's a really helpful approach for players. And I think it also helps them see their own efficacy, which is like, if you say for the first 10 minutes, we're going to, we're going to press hard. First of all, it's not sustainable to press hard for the whole half. So like 10 minutes of it, it's probably tactically smart, but I can see the difference because we're all really able to focus on it for that sustained amount of time. But the second, to, maybe to your point, Christian, about like, and what do we do if I'm anticipating possible changes by the opposition? I think the two things that I would want to stress as a coach in that situation is one of my questions would be, what will tell us whether they are doing this? We think they might do this. What, what will the visual cues, the cues in their play be that we will see that will tell us that it's happening? Because I think so often, right, you can't pay attention to something, you can't make a decision about something that you're not noticing. And so now I'm sort of, we're having a conversation about, and I'm focusing players' attention on the things that will tell us whether they are, in fact, pressing higher against us or sitting in deeper against us or trying to bait us into the middle of the field, you know, whatever they're trying to do. Now I've made it more likely that we'll see it by having a conversation about what the visual cues will be. And the second thing that I would stress is like, is just language, which is like, language is the single biggest tool that we have to do collective problem solving what are the phrases that will like what are the things we how will we talk about what we see if they're doing it to us what we call what we call that what we say when we see it and what will we say to remind ourselves to do these things if we make the tactical change that we think we might have to make mid you know midstream because i think it's a huge challenge which is every general prepares to fight the previous war, right? It's like a great phrase about history. And I think coaches do that. I could see that in the World Cup, right? How many coaches uh, adapted to what the what the opposition did in the, in the first half and in the second half, it was something totally different and they weren't really prepared for it. So I think like having like thinking about what we see and look for if they're making changes and how we talk about what we say to each other to focus ourselves on this and, and to, you know, for us to let one another know that it's happening and now we need to adjust. One thing that could happen is if one or two guys in your team who recognize that the opposition is baiting us into, you know, X part of the field and, but eight other guys don't notice it, right? Or eight other guys are slow to see it, right? And we want to be able to see it quickly and adjust. It seems that we are bumping up to that working memory topic again, because as we just talked through the last 10 minutes here, there's a lot of considerations going in to what is going to be presented to the team. And again, well-intentioned or not, you might accidentally come again to your phrase, Doug, I think the litany of things to talk mm -hmm. about. So I'll go back, back to you, Memo, and talk about the importance of the staff having some sort of discussion prior to the halftime talk so that it doesn't devolve into that and that there's some organization going into it. So how we've approached it at Austin has been as soon as the whistle blows, we bring in all the players. And then we separate. So players go on themselves for two minutes. We as staff discuss. And one of the reasons we do that is to have players and, and understand who's leading the conversations just like that. And second is us, my assistant is responsible for my emotion regulation and vice versa. So we can stabilize each other. At that time, we've already discussed the three three coaching points of what we want them to to communicate or what we want to bring out in the halftime talk. So with that, we divide the players into groups because it's very difficult to have a conversation with 15 to 18 players all at once. So we divide in groups and then we give them a general topic. Hey guys, you're, you're responsible to talk about pressing. This group is responsible to talk about build and so forth. And when we talk about that stuff, I think it's, it's super important us as, as staff in our technical meetings at halftime is to understand who's going to be bringing out what subjects. So me as a head coach, you know what, I'm going to take over the build. You're going to be responsible for uh, the pressing side. 
and you guys are, we're going to bring in these topics and this is the coaching points we're going to get to. Those are the intricacies of what, how we do it. And it goes back to, you know what, Christian, we haven't talked about this during training. Maybe we need to tell players what we're going to be doing, or you know what, we can guide them into this, this topic or this coaching point because we've, we've discussed it over training. Hopefully we can retrieve it from their memory. I love what Mama's was talking about here. And I think it's so, it's so simple and it's so important because it's, it's, this is an example of like group discipline or group self-regulation among the coaches. One, as you pointed out, Memo, like, let's take a few minutes to process our own emotions and talk it out. So we're like, we're strategic about the emotion we present to the players. There are some times when I want, maybe I need to turn on the hairdryer, but there's sometimes where like, I'm, I'm frustrated and I have to manage that before I talk to the players. But I'm also, we're making a group decision about what we're going to focus on attentionally, tactically. I mean, just to go back to this, like we're, this Ben Freakley quote, what we're always trying to do is manage attention and emotion under <laughs> under challenging circumstances. And so one of the things that often happens is, let's say, um, Memo's a really great and disciplined head coach, and he come and he comes in at halftime and he says, "Guys, there are two, two there are two things we really need to focus on in the second half, and they're X and they're Y. Let's talk about it a little bit. What's your role? What will happen at this? Great." And he finishes, and then we're ready to go. And then I'm the assistant coach, and I jump in, and I'm like, "Here's my chance." And guys, also, right? And then I have five. Th- I have two things that I want to mention, and then the other assistant coach comes in with two things that he wants to mention. And a couple of the parents are shouting things too as we're walking out in the field. And suddenly, like there are eight things. So the idea that the coaches get together and make a strategic decision about what's our emotion that we want to project, what, what's the, the tone we want to project to the players, and what are the two or three things that we want to talk about as a group, and maybe a, a divide. And Memo says, "Look, I'll talk about this, and Doug, you talk about that." But then we're, you know, we're, it's two to three things for all of us that we can really talk about productively at halftime. Yeah. On that. And I think you both have mentioned this and especially the more organized the club, typically the more coaches you do have supporting a team. I think regardless what is being clearly stated here is regardless of one versus three coaches, you need to collectively limit the number of topics, but then there is different reasons why there might be one voice versus multiple voices. How do you make that decision as to whether you have one person who really is the voice in the locker room and the other coaches, their role is supporting that coach in the prep for that versus dividing up some of the points and how they are presented because different voices may have different impacts as well. So how do you make the decision as to how you use a staff, assuming that you're all agreeing on that collectively there's two or three points regardless of how they are presented? Great question. I think it also has to come from the head coach. So the head coach is responsible for for this. And luckily, we're privileged at the academy to have quite a bit of staff and a lot of staff support and go to games and also have input. So how do we how do we manage all those voices? One of the biggest things is understanding how we're going to communicate. And I think it's going to be the head coach's responsibility, whoever it may be, the uh, from a national team level to an under 12 coach or an under six coach is they're responsible for what they want to portray. So how can we create filtration systems in order for, for us to make sure what we want to do. And for myself, my assistant coach, I, I leave him more the tactical where, Hey, can you make sure this defensive principle or tactics is occurring and I'm responsible for this? That's how me and him manage it a little bit, where other staff members may manage it differently. So I think it all ends up coming from the head coach and what they're really interested in in doing or what they feel their strengths is. That's the other thing of understanding what is my weaknesses, what are my strengths, and what is my colleagues' weaknesses and strengths, and how can we both use our strengths in order to improve the or enhance the environment we're having the, the player. I think that's so like, I don't, I think it's so smart, which is like, there's no one solution that there has to be, but I think people want to be useful. And so you have to create a mechanism for your assistant coaches to be useful. And it can be useful by like, we're going to huddle up and you're going to tell me what you've seen in the first half. And maybe I'll communicate most of it, or I'm going to communicate some of it and you're going to communicate some of it. I think those are both legitimate solutions. I would say that what I love about what Memo's done there is I think players distinguish the difference between the the two or three ideas they're clear in their mind when a different speaker presents one like when memo says one idea and his assistant says another idea i think players are clear on on 
um, um, each of those ideas is discrete and distinct. And I think that that's powerful. But if you don't give your assistants a way to share their ideas and notice what they're thinking, it will come out, right? They will start sharing it at times that are not optimal or they'll want to shout it to, you know, like one story that I, I worked once with an NBA team and I watched them practice and it was a brand new NBA head coach. Uh, it's, uh, it's the summer league team. And there are literally, there are like 18 players on the floor and there are literally nine coaches, but they have so many coaches and they're all shouting at once. And every time you touch the ball, someone is shouting to you about something. And, you know, like, it's just, it's distracting and your working memory is overloaded. And like the, what you're hearing is not coordinated. And so what we decided to do was the assistant coaches should, the reason they were shouting at players constantly is because they had no other way to communicate their observations about things that seemed really important. And so the first thing that we did was just, we gave assistant coaches a way to write down what they were seeing. And then a time when the head coach said, great, tell me what you're seeing. And ideally they had specific things that they, specific responsibilities that they were looking for. But when they had a way to productively communicate their observations in a way that made them feel useful to the organization, that gave them an option of, as opposed to just shouting at players at an inopportune moment, things that were actually counterproductive to their performance. I would add to that as well as even if there's the decision is that there's going to be one primary voice, it's probably important to acknowledge when an idea has come from an assistant, even if that assistant is not going to be the one making the point, because there's not much more aggravating to a coach than hearing what they've said being repeated as though it was somebody else's idea, especially if that happens game after game after game after game. And I think that's an important staff management issue at halftime. So we're gonna take one more break and we're gonna come back and we're gonna talk about emotion as Mr. Lemoff has some comments and stories to share on that. ECNL Boys is partnering with Puma for the second year, driving sport forward with the leading products and the next generation of pros who wear them. Puma has proven themselves as the fastest sports brand in the world, the fastest innovation, the fastest players, and the fastest products in the game. They're the perfect partner to complement the speed and talent of our teams. In keeping with their mantra of forever faster, Puma introduces the world's fastest boot, the Ultra. The only boot engineered for speed, the Ultra combines a woven upper with a lightweight outsole for direct forward motion, speed, and acceleration. It's the best in the game, designed for the best players in the game. Soccer.com is proud to partner with the ECNL to support the continued development of soccer in the U.S. at the highest levels. We've been delivering quality soccer equipment and apparel to players, fans, and coaches since 1984. Living and breathing the beautiful game ourselves, our goal at Soccer.com is to inspire you to play better, cheer louder, and have more fun. Visit Soccer.com today to check out our unmatched selection of gear, expert advice, and stories of greatness at every level of the game. Back again with Memo Sequentes and Doug Lemoff talking about game day coaching. And maybe we've saved the best for last because emotion might be the one element that derails everything else at a halftime or a game day environment. But at the same time, used properly, emotion might be the galvanizing catalyst that really launches things forward. So I'll turn it to you, Doug, to kick off the discussion more specifically on emotion. Well, I thought I'd just start, kick us off by telling you a story. Uh, it comes from the world of rugby. Gregor Townsend is the head coach of Scotland's national rugby team. He's a great guy, super reflective. And uh, we had this conversation once about a halftime talk that he had. And I would just say like he acknowledged, and I would agree with him that this is this is a single anecdote and the plural of anecdote is not data. So I don't want to like over conclude from it, but he was like, I keep on thinking about this halftime talk and whether it told me anything. So Scotland and the Six Nations is playing England, who are their biggest rivals. And the first half is like an unmitigated disaster for Scotland. And they're down like four tries and at halftime and the game is basically you know the score is like you know 32 to 3 and walking into the locker room they're like in his mind I don't think you'd ever say this to the players but in his mind he's like this game is lost right <laughs> like my goal is to like I want to rescue the game model here and have players understand what they're supposed to do in situations like this so that the next time around we're better off and so he said, so we walked into the locker room and I think the guy, you know, the players were expecting the hairdryer and they're expecting me to shout, you know, and knock over the whiteboard and like 16 F-bombs. And he said, instead, we just made this decision, like, let's just be really clear and calm and we're going to 
focus on understanding in the two or three situations where we're getting beaten, let's just make sure that everybody understands what their role is and how they fix it and how they should do it. Real And really, he said, I was really thinking about the next game. So I was really calm and really clear. And we talked through the game model. We talked through responsibilities. And he said, and then we went out and we ran off, you know, four tries. And they, they basically like tied the game. They ended up, I, you know, they ended up like losing the game on like a penalty kick in the last minute. But basically it was like this epic comeback. And he just said, like, I can't help thinking about whether, like, whether that told me something about whether the, I think there are times when emotions are productive. And there are times when the emotion is a distraction. And all of my working memory is thinking about, why is he shouting at me? Like, when he's, when he's implying that I'm not, but I am actually playing really hard. And like, is it, you know, uh, is it that I don't want it badly enough? Or is it that like, actually something tactically is keeping me from me? Like, I'm, 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 I'm giving my best. And so like, maybe I, there are times when I think being intentional about the emotion we want to create is important. And sometimes more shouting is not better. And maybe just like one tiny other story I'd add to this is um, Heather Dyche is the head coach of New Mexico's women. I think she's just a really insightful coach and she does things often differently from, you know, what a lot of coaches do. And she, and I asked her about pregame talks and she said, you know, I do a tactical talk in the locker room before players walk out in the field. That's when we do our tactical talk. It's not right before they walk out in the field. Right before they walk on the field is a sort of like emotional regulation, getting players ready to compete. And I said, what do you do then? She said, don't do anything. The, the captains do it, you know, at my level. I don't think this is necessarily true about U12s, but at my level, it's not my, it's not my job to get players fired up to play, right? They should own that. And it, it's better when they feel like it comes from each other. And so the emotional part, we have to, you know, we have to be, ready to fight and struggle, you know, et cetera, from each other. Like she, I think her working theory is like that should come from the players and I should create a venue for the players to talk to each other about the intensity and the, and the demands that they'll expect from each other when they walk on the field. I agree with Doug. I mean, looking at just what we saw on Sunday, Scaloni with Argentina, how calm and composed he was, right? That do we need to bring out emotions for players by us screaming, by us being calm, composed, or by going back to what we discussed earlier, the vocabulary, the words we're saying, how can we tap into that emotions to get the best out of the players? What are they seeing on the sideline? Are they seeing someone who's freaking out with every every call of the ref or every mistake a player is doing or every tackle that's happening? We saw the emotions of Tunisia when in the first game, the tackle was made and celebrated like he he scored a goal. And it was how can that impact the whole team? So I think emotions are a huge driver to an individual's performance and a team's performance. Going back to self-talk, how we stabilize our, or regulate our emotions. Are we talking to ourselves or are we listening to our, ourselves? Because we definitely, uh, Doug, in our last conversation, mentioned we have two types of talks with, and I'll let Doug talk a little bit more of it, but we have two talks of it. Are we talking to ourselves to, to make a positive impact? Are we seeing things with opportunities and how does that impact our emotions? And then I think the other piece that we, we can take from individual sports is the breathing or setting in place with, like as an example with golfers, they breathe before getting into their hitting box or how many bounces, what routines are they making? Like Leo Messi, what he does after he misses a shot, he smiles or after attack, uh, missed call, he smiles. So that's part of him regulating emotions and asking to, to figure out what's next of what our mantra is next action. I, I love that topic and those examples and that mantra of next action. But you know, I think one of the things that you could take away from that is that you, you can't learn to regulate your emotions on game day. You can leverage habits that you've learned in the course of working with the team. A lot of the sort of self-talk stuff that Mem and I were talking about comes from Dan Abraham's research. He's a sports psychologist based in the UK. I just love his work. And he, he talks about the idea of match scripts. So just a little bit of like background and self-talk. Self-talk is fascinating. Like none of us realize this because we don't see or hear anyone else's self-talk. We only hear ourselves talking to each other, but everybody talks to themselves, right? It's clearly something we have evolved to do as humans, right? And, and there are two types of self-talk. One is spontaneous self-talk, which is like, you don't, plan to do it you suddenly are talking to yourself often to like 
regulate and respond to a situation that was stupid or like I'm better than that, whatever it is that you say, like there's spontaneous self-talk. And then there's deliberate self-talk, which is phrases that I, well, things that I say to myself to regulate myself and focus myself productively during performance. And so what Abraham says is a really productive thing for a player to do is to give them a match script, which is to take the two or three things that I want to focus on either emotionally or tactically and boil them down into like really simple phrases that I want to use consistently to remind myself, you know, like stay calm and work hard under pressure or like, you know, earn it off the ball, whatever it is that I put those things that I want to focus on into a phrase that becomes like a mantra that I say to myself during performance. And I use that to regulate my attention or my emotion. And each, you know, each player's match script would be unique to them probably because their psychological profile is unique, but you also could have things that you ask players to be prepared to remind themselves of during the match, right? We're going to, uh, we're going to be pressing hard in this match and it's going to push ourselves to the limit physically. And we're going to be tired so I, all, I want you to be prepared with a phrase that you're going to say to yourself to sustain the effort that's required of yourself, you know, in the second half. So take a minute to think about what, you know, what the phrase you're going to say to yourself to sustain that effort is. Uh, and so, but I think that idea of match script was just, I cue myself into thinking patterns with specific habit. And the more, the more habitual that language is, the more effective it's going to be at cueing the attentional or the emotional state that I want for myself. I want to drill down a little bit more on this topic because I think most people, when you, you hear emotion in coaching, it immediately goes to, well, there's yelling and there's not yelling, right? And it's almost a uh, total negative. And the reality is that a team is not a laboratory. A team that has no emotion is not a team that's going to play well. And a training environment that has no emotion to me is also going to be very blah, and, not, and that will ultimately result in, in poor learning and poor performance. So when you look at teaching players how to manage emotion and thinking about how you may actually use emotion as a trigger for better performance, what are your thoughts on that? Because it's not as simple as people who lose control and yell and, and scream. Obviously, that is counterproductive 99% of the time or 100% of the time. But there's a lot more nuance to managing the emotion of a group, using emotion as a trigger for performance, maybe even using emotion at times to help in retrieval. I just watched a coach address this. It's, uh, I don't know if you guys know Luke Groomer, but he has a great podcast on coaching and he's also a basketball coach. So he showed me a video of him working with his players and he, he showed them video of a basketball player. This is a guy who was a point guard at Duke a couple of years ago. And the video is all about how positive and constructive his body language was it was very intense body it was, this, it was this like player who would just like he would like come up to guys and like chest bump them and like you know give them like a little push when they made a good play just to like celebrate and inspire them and he then asked them to reflect on like so how did how do his teammates feel about playing with this guy and we love team performance because we're motivated by groups and people desperately want to feel belonging and commitment to, you know, one of the hardest things I think as a player is when you're successful as a team, but you have feel like you've not contributed as a player, you know, like you played terribly and gave up the goal, but you won two to one, right? People want to feel like they are contributing. So I just think one of the most important things to give players a model of is how do I make my teammates feel supported and belonging? And like, like people are motivated when they feel successful. So one of the most powerful things I can do as a teammate is make people recognize when they're successful and make them see their contributions and make them know that they're appreciated by their teammates. Because I think a lot of the things that players do emotionally or talk about during the match are very self-focused. They're like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm frustrated, so I'm going to shout at my teammates or my body language is going to be crappy. And it's a real gift to players to help them see, you know, and, yet, and that influences the people around you. And if you want to be a great teammate, and you want to be successful as a team, you should be thinking as much about like, how do I communicate my faith in my opponents, my, my, my faith in my teammates and my appreciation for my teammates constructively and consistently on the field so that we build each other up instead of tear each other down. I think one of the, the biggest things that you mentioned right now, Doug, is, is belonging. And if you guys have had a chance to read Owen Eastwood's book about belonging, he's talking about how ev everyone wants to be in a group setting. 
So if, if they don't feel valued, it goes back to what you mentioned, Chris, Christian, about the staff management. If we're not managing the group in the correct way, we're not going to get the correct buy-in or players' emotions to, to perform at the highest level. Agreed in, in training as well. So one of the biggest things is how, how can we make sure we're creating constraints or activities, one, to make sure it's a, each individual is performing for the team, knowing that each individual needs to get better in order for the, the team to perform at, at its best. And I have to practice that, which I think is where you're going, is I have to practice the constructive emotional behaviors that I want during the game. I have to create opportunities for them to emerge in training, which means like sometimes intensely competitive training environments. And then we have to like socialize the like, are we talking to each other up? Are we being, are we, you know, are we being the teammates that we need to be under duress? Because there's very little you can teach or socialize game day. It has to, you really have to be like leveraging and reminding players what they've learned as part of the culture and training. Well, this has been a fantastic discussion. I think to model the appropriate conclusion from this, I'm going to ask you guys to use your working memory caps to summarize in a few points what you would recommend people take away from this discussion moving forward. And um, we'll start maybe with you, Memo, and then close with Doug. One thing is create a framework for the communication piece for halftime. And what does that framework look like? Tend to do the rule three for the working memory and understanding of who's going to be making those coaching points and how you want them to be discussed. And have we touched base on this during training? If we have, then let's use guided questions. If we have not, then it's a demanding or providing an instruction for the players themselves. And lastly, how are we controlling staff emotions and player emotions to optimally have the team to perform their very best? I think that's really, really powerful and really insightful. Elite athletes' success is a product of their ability to manage their attention and their emotion under complex and difficult circumstances. So as a coach, I'm modeling and socializing and building habits around helping them manage their emotion and their attention. And those things, those things are like attention is very limited. So I have to be really selective about what I focus players on and I have to cause them to think. And for emotions, I just want to like emotions are often a blind spot for us. Right? When we get emotional, we don't tend to be self-reflective. So being intentional about observing our own emotions, you know, I know that for Chris Apple, who's um, he's, he's the head coach at, University of Rochester's men's team, he said something really ins insightful to me. He said, whenever I'm planning a training activity, in addition to planning what players do, I often plan my emotional level. Like, what kind of emotion am I trying to project to players at this point? Because that will be the emotion that best, best helps them develop as athletes. And I just think that's, A, I think it's a smart thing to do during training. And I think it's a doubly smart thing to do on game day. And it requires a fair amount of practice and self-regulation. And to one final point that Memo made, it's a great role for coaches to do with each other, right? Like what should we, hey, help me recognize when I'm when I'm I'm losing my intentionality and and let's even talk about what we think the emotion we want to project to players now is so that we both model it and talk about it. This was a fantastic discussion. I feel like we could go on, but I think we've reached a good stopping point. Appreciate both of you guys sharing your insight and being a part of our podcast. And I'm sure we'll have you back soon. Christian Labor is so right on so many levels, a fascinating discussion and a great edition of Breaking the Line, the ECNL podcast. My name is Dean Linke. I want to also thank our producer, Colin Thrash. I want to especially thank Andrea Wheeler, Jen Winnego, and the great folks at the ECNL. For each and every one of them and all of you, we'll see you in two weeks for another edition of Breaking the Line, the ECNL podcast. Thanks for listening to Breaking the Line, the ECNL podcast. For more information on the ECNL, visit us at www.theecnl.com. And if you have a suggestion for the show or a great idea for a guest, please email us at info at theecnl.com. Breaking the Line, the ECNL podcast is an ECNL production. ECNL, more than a league.